All right, so we're going to be looking today at, with Swift, we're going to look at the structure of an array and how an array is not the hipster we have in Java. And we're going to look at that using the Swift Playground using Xcode. And we're going to take a look at how we can play around with that. Again, we have the lovely Swift Programming Language Guide. Fantastic resource. Highly recommend you use it. Try things out from there. Take a look at that. Uh, quick and a quick look at this right here. As you can see on the language grid, we have three built-in data structures in Swift. We have arrays, sets, and dictionaries. With the array, it looks more. It looks like an array in Java, but it also looks like an array list. It is a ordered list, um, an ordered set of structure where it has a index and a value attached to it. We can put anything in an array, as long as it's that type. So we can make an array of ints, we can make an array of cards, we can make an array of people. Any one kind of thing, or one object, or tuple even, can go into an array. It has, as long as it has a start at zero, go down to whatever value it's storing in, and we will have that stored as an array. But unlike Java, where arrays are hipster, arrays don't have methods, arrays don't have um, any way of accessing them other than the square bracket accessor, in Swift, arrays are true regular objects. It ha they have methods, and they work like that, and they're resizable. Java arrays, not resizable. Swift arrays, resizable. So it's actually more like an array list, but we'll have it as an array. And we'll see more about that as we go through. The other two data structures we can look at are the ideas of sets and dictionaries. We'll be doing more of those as we continue working with that. A set is the rule, just like a math set. It has to be a discrete set of values, no duplication. And a dictionary has a set of keys and a, that must be discrete and a not necessarily and also unordered set of values. So in that case that we have with a dictionary, there are only X keys and there are no more than X values. Or, uh, there's no more, there, um, yeah, there's, there's X keys and there's no duplication of the keys. But with, a, with the values, there could be, for example, the same key could refer, uh, different keys could refer to the same value. So I could have less than X values, even though I have X keys. But the, the actual, the keys themselves must be discrete. There cannot be any duplication of the keys in a dictionary. And we'll talk more about that as we continue on with our development. And we'll see that especially in second semester. So that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at Xcode. We're going to switch over to that. We're going to start a new playground. And we're going to do the playground with OSX, and so we're going to give it a name again. And so we'll do afternoon playground. And this is our second playground we've done. Now you can choose either OSX or iOS, or even if you wish to, tvOS. We're just going to use OSX for the default for this in class. And we're going to go to go next. And I'm putting that inside my afternoon folder, and I'm actually going to make a uh, folder in this inside my afternoon projects folder so I can have this in GitHub so we can actually keep track of this. So I'm going to make a new folder inside afternoon. And I'm going to have this called Playgrounds. And that way I can put all my playgrounds in one folder. And I'm just going to create right here. We've got that ready to go. And I'm going to make the quick change for that so we can have this inside GitHub for us. And so we'll go over to Finder. Make a new finder window. And in my Swift project folder, I have my afternoon folder. And in my afternoon folder, when it shows up, we have my playgrounds folder. I'm going to move my sample playground that we did that first one. Move that in. And the afternoon playground, our other one we did the other day. Move that into the folder as well. And now I'm going to open up GitHub, and I'm going to have my playgrounds be their own project. So that way my pro all my stuff inside my playgrounds will be able to store on GitHub, and we can have that available to turn in vis-a-vis -vis our regular GitHub link if I have you turn in any codes for playground on that. And we can also keep track of it as well. So we've got GitHub opened right here. I'm going to take a look, make sure my playgrounds are all named nice and happily. Yes, they are. Hooray, hooray. And so I'll just drag my Playgrounds folder in to GitHub. And it's a repo. We're going to create an add.
and my playgrounds folder. As you can see right here, we have a variety of files that are in that. So I have my support code.swift, so it's the stuff that's going along with it and everything that's going to compile with that. So the only thing I really want to get rid of this is that actually looks like good. So it's all the stuff that we have inside there. I'm saying I'm okay with having those files in there. So I'm going to go ahead and create a playground repo. And I'm going to commit that to its master. And so I have my playgrounds repo. It's committed to master. I don't have to worry about any um, background files or compilation because it's just inside my lovely little component right here. And we'll keep that ready to go. And so I've got that committed, so I have that access to it. I can publish it as needed. We're going to go into Xcode. I'm going to maximize the screen so we can have that right here for us. And we're going to be playing with our playground. So again, in our playground, we have the ability right here. We have our um, lovely set of line numbers. so We can keep track of what happens on the left. We have our middle section right here, which is our editor window. And then over here on the right, we can actually see the values of the components we've been um, playing with and using. And so we're going to play with that here really fast and do some uh, basic stuff. Now, as you guys know, I really do not like the hello world or anything else like that. So we're going to go ahead and just get rid of that because it, we don't need it. And we'll go ahead and we'll give this a nice little structure for it. So we'll make a var. And we, remember, actually, we'll do this as a let. So we'll make a constant. And we'll say let. And we'll make the variable name for this be afternoon playground. And we'll do an explicit declaration. It's of type string equals quotes. So we have our uh, variable, we use explicit declaration right here. So we explained that it's a of type string. We're immediately assigning a value into it of learning Swift. As we can see over here on the right hand side, we see the quotes around it saying that's what's stored inside that variable. Because I use the keyword let, it is a constant. And so we should actually uh, change that naming convention to make it be more of a regular constant naming. So let's do that right now. And so we'll go over here and we'll just fix that up. So we'll do name our uh, constant naming convention. So it's using a caps on that because it's a constant. We're not gonna be changing that. And so we'll have that same naming convention we've been using in Java. So we can keep track of it so we're not gonna lose our, our Java knowledge, but we also can have some consistency across our code style, and that helps us so we can keep that going. So again, the let makes this a constant, and we're using explicit declaration, so in our notes, we can do that vis-a-vis -vis our documentation right here, or do it just an inline comment, and so we have an explicit declaration of a string. And we use that as a constant right there with let. And so we have a note that we're doing that. We can do the same thing with using a regular var. And so we'll do that right here and say var And so I've now done my words equals afternoon playground. Because I've set it as a variable, however, of a var, I have implicitly assigned it now to be a string. So var is implicitly a string. I can't change it now from any other variable type. I have to actually use it as a string from this point on. However, because it, my words is a var right here, it's changeable. I can change it. So I'm going to say my words equals new stuff. And as we can see right here over on the right hand side, my words now has its value inside it, new stuff. And we can test it out by printing it right here. So again, with Swift, we, we call print by just typing the word print, parens, and then the variable that we want to print. And we'll print that out. Over on the right hand side, we have new stuff and then a backslash n. So we have, it's saying that there's a, it's going to printing a new line on that. So it'll just go straight there onto the screen, passing it a new line. So when it would print out, it'll actually have that content in there. And versus when I say print and I choose afternoon playground,
it will print learning Swift. Again, the backslash N indicates that it's a new line. So to just when it prints, it'll print that out and move to the next line. And that's just a lovely little indicator to us that when it prints it, that's what would show up on our console if we were actually to print this on the screen for us. So we have implicit declaration and implicitly set as a string. I can no longer change my words to be any other type. I cannot say my words equals seven. As you can see right here, we get a lovely red stop sign type symbol. We hover over that with the exclamation point. And you cannot assign type int into type string. So with Swift, even though it is a loosely typed somewhat language, we cannot reassign variables willy nilly. We must use, once it's been implicitly defined, either vis-a-vis -vis this style right here where I assign a string value into it, or explicitly by defining of type string when I actually create the variable, once that has a explicit declaration or implicit by assigning the value, we can no longer change the type of stuff inside it. So that's something you want to make sure we have in our notes that once, imp once we've implicitly or explicitly assigned a value, we can't change what's inside there. So just a quick little thing on that so we can't do that. I'm going to leave that error over there. I'm going to just say like this, my words equals quotes, and we'll say other words. And so at this point, as you can see, my red line, my red error is still showing up. It prevents that next line from fi um, reassigning it because it blocks the actual thing in the playground. So one of the things we notice when we're playing with our playground inside Swift, if we do not see a valid response right here, over here on the right-hand side across from our actual line of code, that means we probably have an error, whether it be a compile time error up above, like on this one, my, my words equals seven, or some other runtime error that happens because we've caused some other logic problem or we didn't do something properly but it doesn't actually crash, we'll have it so it won't show our display up over there. Questions? So since my word is implicit and you said it equals after the playground, it literally cannot go anything else now. It is now stuck as a string. It is stuck as a string, exactly. That's what the implicit declaration means. And the question was, be, um, since we said my words equals afternoon playground, that uh, string variable is, or string um, constant, excuse me, has been assigned into the variable my words. At that point, from here on down, my words can only hold string variables or string values. And so this line right here is causing that problem because seven is not a string. I can fix that by going around seven with quotes. And that we'll see over here on the right hand side that my words will have seven. And then my words has other words. So I can hold a integer value as a string, but only by putting it around in quotes around it, so I force it to convert to a string. So Swift, with its implicit, once I implicitly define something or explicitly define something, I can't change its type. So like Java, once it is typed, it's stuck, but Java we must always explicitly define. Swift, we, once we define it implicitly or explicitly, it is stuck at that type. So if I go up here, and I make another variable. Some variable has nothing inside it. It has a problem attached to it as well. I've just declared a variable and I'm missing the annotation mister and pattern. I'm, I'm doing something wrong, it's expecting something. And so let's see what that is problem. It's missing its type annotation, so it's expecting a type. So let's try and go over right here after that. Let's try it down here. So var other variable and no semicolon. And so it's expecting something to be put there. So I say equals seven. My other variable now can only hold int. So I can only hold int values in it. I can't say other variable equals 3.415. And so on the same thing right here, I can't force a int value to now hold a double value. So we hover over this and you can assign type double into type int. And so I, once I've defined it as a type, I can't simply just shove things in there. 
So that's something we have to realize that in Swift, once we've assigned a value type to it, it's stuck at that value type. We can't change it. So if I wish to put 3.452 into that, I can either type that as 7.0, which will force that to be a double, and that will work, or I can cast this as an int. And casting in Swift is a little bit different. I do the type, and then parens around what I'm casting. And so I have cast the 3.452 value as an int to shove it into other variable. So other variable was seven. I then overrode that value by casting 3.452 as an int, which then puts it to three. Because again, int can only hold counting numbers, so it drops off that 452. It doesn't matter if it's 952, it's still gonna be three because there's no rounding involved. It simply just chops off that decimal value. So that's how we cast inside that. So we'll put a little note on there that we're casting. And remind ourselves that we're using the Swift notation. So we have that right there. We're casting a double as an int. I hit save. So a great time to go over, go to GitHub. And I should have a commit on here. Yep, I do, I have uncommitted changes. So changed some code in the playground. And commit to master. We've gone back over there, we've got that committed. We're looking at that structure. So I have that committed now. I've got that change. We can see how we've dealt with both strings and doubles. We've talked about casting. But what I really want to look at is how to deal with the idea of an array, since that's something we just introduced in Java recently. We want to look at how we're going to handle that inside Swift. So to do it in Java, it would have looked like this. So we'll write Java version. And we'd say int array my nums equals new int So our Java version would look like that. So we'd have a int array minums is a new int array of size four or of length four. It's stuck at four things that can't change. There are no methods other than those that are assigned automatically by object. And it has only that one public data member, really weird and hipster. However, in Swift, we're gonna do that a little bit differently. We're gonna make an array in Swift. We will say that we're gonna say a var. Again, all, everything starts with var. And we're gonna call it minums. and equals, and then square brackets, capital I int, and then parens to call its init. So we have initialized an array of integers. There is nothing inside it yet. It is merely an empty array object. There's nothing inside there. As we can see over here on the right hand side of our playground, that we see those square brackets indicating that it is an array. And then instead of having, like here, where this would initialize it with four um, sockets with all filled with zero because it's an int type, in Swift, it simply just creates the allocation for it. And so let's take a look at that. To add to it, we have to actually put things in the array. So I would say minums dot append parens and then the value. I have added inside minums, I've added three to the last spot. The equivalent of Java would be my nums sub zero equals three. So we have that same structure. That's what we've done in the Java version. There's the same version in Swift. So we'll put our Swift version right here as well. So we can actually see that what we're doing is inside Swift looks a little bit differently. So we have our Java version where we just assign it, we declare it, it says a bigness immediately and it has four things in it. In Swift, we simply call its init method by using the parens around that, which initializes it to, of an array of ints of nothing inside it, and then I add pieces to it, and I can add as many as I'd like. Printing this is, looks a lot different. So we add three, then 45, then 34, then one, two, three, four, and if I print it, it prints three, comma, four, comma, five, comma, one, two, three, four, all inside square brackets, and then dumps a new line in. So, we have a very different way of dealing with that inside Java. 
than we inside Swift. So they're very different for the languages of dealing with that. And so we can see that we have the ability to actually look at that right here, and we can continue doing that. Now, the Java array list, which is most like the array of Swift, is a little bit different still. In a Java array list, we'd have a, so Java array list is gonna be something like that as well. And so I'd say, I'm gonna have that be, we could only put in objects in there. So we'd say, array, uh, so we'd say array list of type string, my words equals new array list type string, call the constructor. And then we'd say um, my words dot add parens stuff. So in the Java version of an array list, we'd do that. To use it, with, since the Swift array works like that, instead we don't have a dot add method though. So if we go like this and I do var my words equals, and then square brackets, and it's string is our type, and then call it init, and then do my words dot add, passing it stuff, not struff. We're gonna get an error message right here. So we have a couple things, let's take a look at that. So an invalid redeclaration of my words. Oh, let's change that to be my words list. Oops. Okay, let's fix that so we have that to be my words list. Let's make sure we have actually the right variable. I forgot I use my words. So in Java, we'd have my words list dot add. But if we hover over here on our error, the exclamation point, we see that the value of type string array has no member add. So in our notes, in when we're debugging Java code, we'll see um, the, um, the, they have an error message that says that we've never seen that method before. That method is unfamiliar. In Swift, that same error message is saying that the type string array has no member add. So there's no method called add on this. But I can insert into a certain spot. And so to do that, I'd use, it's like the two parameter version of add. So I call insert stuff and then comma and colon index equals Make sure I'm doing this right. <coughs> they do two commas? Yeah, you do two commas. No, it's expected a second comma, so. <coughs> there we go. At index, at index. Ah, yes. So at colon at index. There we go. So in the array, so do with a, to add at a certain spot, we use the at index and we call the insert method. And so in Swift, it's a little bit different. We have a two parameter way to insert things at a certain spot. Now, I, as, I put, as I did that there, I put it at index zero. It puts it in there, so it's at the beginning. I cannot, however, go over here and put that, say, at index seven. I get an execution error. Because how many things are inside words list right now? Right here, there's zero. So the only spot I can add to is zero. If I had 15 items in there, I could add up to 15. So if we start counting at zero, I can only add to the last spot, which is the count size. So I can only put up to here, up to zero. That's fine. Totally great, but if I try and put that at one, because there's nothing in there yet, I'll get that same error message right here, that there's a bad execution instruction. I can't add to a spot that doesn't exist. So the last spot you could add to 
is you can only add to the last spot that's in the list right now. Since there was nothing in there, the last spot would be zero. So we also need to find out how to get the bigness of it. In Java, the bigness of an array equals dot length. In Swift, so let's do Java bigness. But Swift version, we have print, and we'll do it this way, minums.count. So in Swift, to get the bigness of an array, the member we call is count instead of length. So similar approach, but a little bit different. So we have a count method or member that is part of the array for the type. And we call that count to actually get how many things are inside it. Versus in Java, we call the dot length. So it's a little bit different. We can also remove from a array in Swift that you can't do inside that. Now, the other thing on the arrays that's different, so what would happen is it would print this on the console right there, that uh, backslash n, not slash n, but backslash n. So it would print it, and then the curse would go down to the next line. And the stuff without slash n? It's just, it's just what's inside it right there. So it's just showing the contents. So this line above it says inside my nums right now just has 3, 45, 34, 1, 2, 3, 4. But when I print it right here, it says it would print it, and then the curse would go down to the next line. So yeah, the, these previous lines just show what's inside it. So right now inside my nums, there's nothing. My nums has three. My nums has 345. My nums has 345.34. My nums has 345.34, 1,234. And then I print my nums, so it prints 345.34, Good question. And we want to look at one more thing with this. We want to look at how we can actually do some loops because loops are something we do quite often in programming. And in Java, we have the for each loop or the enhanced for. That's the loop where it looks like this. So it'll say for parens type variable colon structure. And it'll, it'll loop over all of those things in that structure. And that the type has to be this, whatever is stored inside that structure. The Swift version is similar. It's called a for in loop. And so to do that, we're going to do it over here. We're going to do for, and we'll say my num in my nums squiggles, and then I do print my num. And so that would execute four times, as you can see right there. So notice how it's a little bit different for the Java version. In the Java version, we'd have to specify the type, and we also have parens inside there. On the Swift version, we don't need the parens on it, it's just for, for my num inside my nums. So the, the type is implied, you can only use a for in loop on <coughs> things that actually can be iterated over. So I can't, it automatically says whatever's inside my nums is what I'm using. I don't have to force it to be something else. So in the case of this where I do the type of it right there, I'd have to do it like this for Java if I'm using my nums, it would be for parens, um, lowercase i, int, int my num, colon my nums. So the Swift version, the Java versions looks like that. The Swift version, we simply just do for space variable in structure and then our associated squiggles it's actually copied that one that looks a little bit better So on our loop for that, for a for loop, a for each loop or a for in loop, for each Java, for in Swift, we have the for type variable structure and then whatever code we do inside that. The same thing in Swift is a for variable in structure, 
Notice there's no parens in there, and we simply just have our execution statement. So again, we have some very um, clear differences between what we're doing in Swift as what we're doing in Java. So there's some definite differences between the languages, even though they're fairly similar. We can also do a regular for loop. The for loop in, in Swift looks very similar to a regular for loop in Java. So I can do for, and I do var my num -er equals zero. Let's do this so you do spacing right. Look, make it look pretty. And then my number is less than my nums dot count semicolon my nums plus equals and we'll do that two. So we'll execute, we'll add two to it each time to the variable and we'll say print my number. So that will work. That seems to be my number. Thank you for catching that. So we have for var my number equals zero. My number is less than my nums dot count. My number plus equals two. That will only execute two times because it starts off at two, adds two to it. Two is zero is now two. Two is still less than the count. Executes again. Two is now four. Four is no longer less than count, so it exits out. So the plus equals again just adds two to it and moves on. So we've got that right there. So we've looked at really fast. Hit save really quick. Make sure we commit to GitHub again as well. And we tested loops. So looking at what we did really fast, we played with the playground. We looked at the idea of using explicit declaration and implicit declaration. We looked at how to actually deal with strings and ints. We talked about casting as well. We talked about how the array in Swift is not the hipster of code. The array in Swift is more like a regular collection or data structure that we would see. It has methods. It has um, the ability to call on it. And we have various dots we can use within it. We saw append, insert, and count. We will look at the idea of removal as well and how to do that later. The um, square bracket structure is still used, but we can only use the square bracket structure once we've already initialized a value. So I can go in right here and I can say that my nums sub zero equals nine or 98. I can then change what's inside my nums at position zero and I can print my nums. And as you can see right there, I changed what was inside the first position of my nums to be 98. But I cannot go and say my nums position five, actually four, let's do the right, right spot, equals 34 or 341. Let's make sure it's, it's clearly different. And I print my nums. If you notice, I'm not even getting a response right here. Nothing is happening because you can't access vis-a-vis -vis square brackets until it's had a value appended or inserted into it. So the square brackets in Java, we always use. In Swift, we can only use square brackets after we've already done something with it. So it's a very big change. So, so uh, the, uh, the hipsterness of arrays in Java, none of that cross applies to the hipsterness of arrays in Swift.